Hello and welcome to Inside Fingal, the podcast that gives you an insight into the work being done by the councillors and staff of Fingal County Council to make Fingal a better place to live, work, visit and do business in. My name is Jerry McDermott, I'm the Media and Communications Manager here at Fingal County Council and I hope you'll stay with me as we continue to inform you about the work of your local authority. The recent World Cup qualifier between Portugal and Ireland in Faro captured the headlines for many reasons, not least the two late goals by Cristiano Ronaldo, which gave him a world record and also won a game that his team looked likely to lose as half full-time loomed. But there was one storyline that caught our attention, and that's why this episode of Inside Fingal is going to be about education, innovation, transition year, Brexit, personal development, fitness, and of course, football. In the 36th minute of that World Cup qualifier in Faro, Ireland defender Dar O'Shea was injured and was replaced by a 19-year-old substitute making his senior international debut. It was a real sink or swim moment for Andrew Omobamedili, but his performance against Portugal and six days later at the Aviva Stadium against Serbia, where he played the full 90 minutes, impressed everybody. And he looks like a player who, barring injury, will be around for a long time in a green jersey. So... What's the link between Andrew Omobadili and Fingal County Council? Well, in 2018, Andrew graduated from the Football and Fitness Transition Year course, which Fingal County Council runs in partnership with the Football Association of Ireland in Cordoff Sports Centre. And he's the first graduate from the course, which started in 2016, to play at senior international level. So I'm delighted to be joined for episode 13 of Inside Fingal by the course coordinator, Dennis Highland, to find out more about this unique and innovative project. Dennis, welcome to Inside Fingal. Thanks, Jerry. It's great to be here today. And, and it's great to have you. And I, I got to start with Andrew Omobamadili. How did you feel when he came on against Portugal? Yeah, look, Jerry, we're excited. Um, we're delighted for Andrew, first of all, uh, for his family as well, his coaches, and uh, all his mentors down the years in, in League Slip FC. Uh, again, personally, myself, I was just sitting there and I was thinking to myself, this kid was only on our course three years ago. And, and now he's sitting here. And now he's contested against Ronaldo, probably the best player ever, um, and a World Cup qualifier as well. Um, so it was a bit surreal. Um, I was delighted for him. Um, I was also delighted for a lot of people, particularly Fingal County Council, who have backed the course into its infancy. You know, um, as you said, you go to them 216 about the course, as run the pilot, and this is, these are the type of examples we've given them, you know, keep kids at home, give them full-time training, and hopefully go on and reach their maximum potential. So for me, it was a to think if we could even help Andrew out, we've helped him by one or two percent on his journey. Fantastic, but yeah, real proud moment for the course. And did you think he would make that journey to where he's got to so quickly? Oh, I'd be a lawyer, Jerry. You were saying that. I'd be a lawyer. Uh, no, look, Andrew had attributes. He was like, he's athletic, as you'll see. He's quick. He's strong. Very composed on the ball. So, when, so when Andrew came in in 2017. Um, he was a real late developer as well at the time. So we hadn't been capped at underage international level. So, um, but a real quick journey for him. At the end of the year, Colin O'Brien brought him into the under-17s for the European Championships, uh, which is unheard of that he went to the 19s then with Tom Owen the same year um, as Tom had, had some dropouts. So it was a real, real quick journey for him. Um, really developed over the year for himself. And uh, I think for me, the big thing for Andrew was that he went away to full-time training the advantage he had of being spending the year with us really kicked in for him and he really came on leaps and bounds, you know. And to think Andrew was only another 21 squad, he's forced on the 21 squad in March. The same in the Aviva even last night playing against Serbia was unbelievable, you know. So to answer your question, the answer is no. Yeah. Would I see Andrew going on a quick journey like that? But I think anyone in football will tell you, very, very difficult to predict where kids are going to go, you know. They all have good potential and that's what we give them the opportunity on the course for. Well, well, we'll talk about Andrew and some of the other talent that has graduated from the course later in the programme. But can you tell me, Dennis, how the idea for this course came about? Because it is very unique. Yeah, Jerry. Um, previous to this course, as uh, you are speaking about earlier on, we used to run Project Futsal. Uh, I remember talking about Stephanie Roach earlier on. We'd run a course for between 18 to 7 year olds and we covered education. FITAC level five and uh, again collaborating that with with some stuff on the pitch you know football and coaching so from that we just felt there wasn't a real need for the course anymore um, as we come out of recession and we just myself and my colleague Martin Doyle um, went to our boss at the, in the FEI at the time which was Jerry Reardon um, and Marion Brown and Fingal with a proposal and then we went to Paul Reid who was the CEO of Fingal County Council who's now at the HSE 
And um, we just went with the idea. We've seen it in Scotland as well, where the performance school, giving the kids the opportunity to experience full-time training in their own environment. Um, and again, we just felt that at that particular time, we had kids going away on YTS schemes at 16 years of age for, for 60 quid a week and come back two years later and saying, surely we can provide an opportunity for this for these kids. And as I say, 216, we were delighted to get the go-ahead from, as I say, Marion Brown, Jerry and, and Paul uh, Reed at the time. And as I say, the course has gone from strength to strength. You know, it really has. Yeah, it certainly has. And and tell me, what are you trying to achieve on the course? Like, how do you judge success? Well, again, the, the, the main thing for us, to give that player the opportunity to experience uh, full-time football. So live the life of a footballer for a year um, and combine it with education. You know, so for us to show them what, what we can give them on, on their own doorstep rather than having to go to England. So Andrew would be a great example of a kid who kicked on from the full-time training. But there's also other kids that it's not for them. You know, football, they find out. So you don't have to go to to Stephen to find out that football is for them. We, we give them the same syllabus. You know, we, we really focus in on their mindset, you know, and uh, and the attitude that it needs to be to be a footballer. And, and for us, um, that's our real focus, you know, and that's what we're trying to achieve for them. And again, success for us is it's giving them the opportunity to reach their maximum potential whatever that may be if it's if it's going to play for the senior team brilliant if it's going to ucd on a scholarship a lot of our students have gone brilliant and if it's going to work in the gym industry fantastic so all we're there is creating that opportunity for the players and as we always say to them when you get that opportunity you need to be ready so that's what we're there for so that's success for us and and how is the course structured like what would a normal week look like um, a normal week would be it's it's full time training, so we're on the same academic year as secondary school. So we come in on a Monday morning, um, we do our strength and condition for uh, first thing, then we go out onto the pitch, we do our reality based training sessions, have our lunch, and then in the afternoon we do our education. So our education would be uh, we we cover maths, English, high tech gym instructor, and we also have a range of guest speakers coming in. You know, from from different different areas of the game. You know, only just before we finished with the under twenty ones international manager and speaking to the players, we had Andy Reid in. You know, we had Darrell Darrell Broy or Darrell O'Shea, should I say, on just recently as well. So again, whole range of people coming in and trying to educate the players. You know, and what it takes to be a professional footballer. You know, and and obviously the response from the the pupils on on the courses is, is very positive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. As I say. For us, it's just about giving them, the, as I say, lifelong lessons, you know, whether it be from high performance cooking, you know, that's something they will always have for the rest of their life, whether it's gym instruction, the principles don't change, and giving them an insight into our principles for international football. So, again, kids are coming from all different clubs, but we're coming in with to marry, uh, try to get them ready. If they do get the opportunity to go into international football or go League of Ireland, our principles of play. So that's really reward about with the kids and the response has been phenomenal you know and and obviously they obviously go on that course for that football element and that but that, that you talked about the, the fitness and the coaching certification as well as the education aspect how, how important is that like I, I suppose that's probably something that that gives the parents a little bit of comfort as well yeah definitely Jerry. as i say i uh little lane you know little lane instruction they're the only we're the only course of its kind in the country that they cater for for 16-year-olds. So, so for example, if, if the kid was to go and do the OITEC gym instruction away from our course, it would cost them €2,200 in, in a college at night, and he'd have to be 16 years of age. But they facilitate us because they've worked us since our infancy. And, and as I say, that alone is fantastic for the kids to have. Um, some of our students, um, actually young Ken Clark has actually just gone and done his own fitness business now as a result of the course. He was on our second course. But I think the, the key for the education is relating it. It's a lot, a lot of um, sports industry related. Um, and again, lifelong lessons, as I, as I just spoke about a second ago, even the cooking, you do a block of cooking, healthy cooking lessons. They're lessons that they, they bring home to their own family as, 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 along with the high tech gym instruction, you know, and as I say, our maths and English is really catered around football as well. And um, so it's fantastic. And, and as I say, I know I mentioned the education and other things of bringing guest speakers in like Jim Crawford and stuff from the other 21s, but we also bring in Carlo IT, UCD, scholarships from America and just show the guys that there's more than one 
one journey, one one pathway for the players, if you know what I'm saying. So all the players, yes, they all want to go to England, but if they're not if they're not going to play there or abroad, we just try and open their doors for them to go and show them what else they can deal with football. So, for example, last week we were, from, we were playing against UCD, and there's two lads who are on our course on scholarships there, you know. Uh, so that gives me as much as joy as I've seen Andrew playing for the senior team, to be quite honest, you know. Yeah, and and you've had quite a good record um, with, with your pupils in that, in that, you know, a lot of them have gone on the course and, and you know, maybe a little bit of, like Andrew weren't on the radar and have broken into international squads and, and you know, have been able to progress their careers, whether it's into uh, League of Ireland or into the national underage leagues or, or into the international teams. Yeah, we've quite a few um, players and, and even just up to this week, Jerry, just recently, as you know yourself, the September window, um, for international football, so I, I'm involved in the right things myself. We had three of our pupils um, on that particular trip. Um, then with the with Paul or Colin O'Brien's under 17s last week, there was seven of last year's students in his squad, which is which is quite a lot. It's nearly 50 percent of the squad. Um, the under 19s, Tom Mow was only in Lockbury there last week as well. He had five of our students, and Jim Crawford's just back from a double header, um, and he's had three of our students again. So and then obviously Andrew's with the senior team. So as I say, we're five years into the project now and it, it seems to be going from strength to strength with players going on and playing at the highest level. There's also a lot of our students now playing in the Premier Division and also playing in the first division and combining their studies with football, which is fantastic, you know. And what sort of feedback are you getting from managers, you know, in in, in terms of, of of the players that you are helping to produce? Well, I think particularly the, it's fantastic for the international managers. You know, I, I have a, a big good relationship with all the managers in international football. They come up and they'd, they'd speak to me about a certain player might might to work on a certain aspect of his game. And I think that's the, the fantastic part about the course is we're full time. So the, the clubs are fantastic. They're training seven or four, four nights a week with the clubs, but it's very difficult to get that extra time in as well for them. And um, so it's great collaboration between us and the clubs. Now, the international manager wants them to work on individual stuff. That's where we can really kick in and help the kids. And I feel that's for them, it's a real advantage. And I feel, again, we spoke about it a lot and hopefully it will come to fruition. We're hoping to put a few more of them around the country, you know. And these are all kids in transition years. So what's the reaction of their schools when they sort of say that they want to go away and, and sort of go on this course for the year rather than do transition year through the school? Well, I think... I, we're actually an independent school as well, which is which is brilliant. We've come on since its infancy, but but in, in terms of the schools, the schools have been really really supportive. So they see it as an opportunity. As these kids are now role models in their school, you know, and um, so they come out. Um, and and one of the feedback we are, we do get from schools and from parents is that that how the kids mature over the year. So we give them a lot of responsibility, a lot of autonomy with the kids. And you know, for example, we always encourage the parents not to not to drive them in make sure they get the transport in at their own public transport in. Just taking out gear, giving them chores, they're giving them responsibilities, even for example, on their individual learning plans, we keep telling them we don't go around to see if they're working on their finishing or their defending. We give them an allocated time and we, we just observe and, and then if they're not doing it, well that's a mindset thing for them, you know. So we go back and we visit with them and say, look, it's the things they really are doing when people aren't looking that counts rather than when they're looking, you know. So, again, they're only 15, 16 years of age. But one thing we certainly get from the feedback from the parents is how mature they come at the end of the year. And you, you mentioned they're giving them responsibility. And one of the things that struck me about it when I was sort of looking at the uh, programme is that they go back to their primary schools to uh, to do some coaching. Yeah, it's a huge part of the programme, uh, Jerry, a huge part because we see them as role models and... They go into their primary school and they deliver uh, fun sessions from PDP1 coach education. There's a link to coach education on the course as well. We cover the PDP1, PDP2. So they go into the primary schools and get the kids involved in football. From We try to target junior infants, senior infants, fourth class. And again, try and get that link from them into their local club as well. So there's a real link there, you know. And if you can imagine a kid coming back into the primary school who's playing for his international team, you know, it's real it's sporting for the young kids. So it's a real part of the programme, um, huge for, for, the, for the council and for the FAO to increase participation. So, yeah, it's brilliant. I suppose uh, people who are interested in this course uh, are probably asking the one question, and I, I'm going to ask it now, is how do you get on this course? 
basically email myself, dennis.hoyland at fei.ie or fingalsports at fingal.ie. Um, so, yeah, and again, our application is only open in, in January. Um, and then we take the applications until the end of March. And then from then we have our trial process. Um, and so so how, how does that work? How do, how do you choose? Like, I'm, I'm sure it's it's oversubscribed in, in terms of the, the places. Yeah, yeah. We, we I think we, we, we had to show our 90 applicants this year and we can only choose 25. So how the application process works is um, you send in the application uh, the, and we send back the application form take them in and again we look for the last two school reports we also look for where, what level they're playing at, at the minute and then from that we do our two trial days and then lead into our final t- trial day we select 25 uh, successful students so we, we, we hope to complete that by the end of may every year obviously with covid it's been a little bit different to come on to the summer um, and then we we're starting again as we just spoke about next monday which we're really looking forward to and it, and it is a big commitment because like Fingal is obviously a big county and, and the, the course is based in Cordoff, which is in the southwestern part of the county. And you have players coming from, the, you know, the, the, the north of the county and, and the east of the county, you know, making journeys from Donna Bate and Malahide and Balbriggan and places like that. Yeah, it's a huge commitment for, for the players. And again, it's another one that we say by the end of the year, if they're really committed to their football, you know, and, and to be honest with you, 99.9% of the time they are. But there, like to be an early force team, they got to not only the football element of it, they've also got to look after their rest and recovery. You know, it's a huge change to the body going full time training. You know, so for them to look after and take ownership of that, um, it's fantastic. And I say, you're, you're right, some of the guys it could take them two, two and a half hours to get to, to Cardiff. But again, it's all part about that discipline, you know, and that mindset. If you really want something, you've got to work really, really hard and um, we drive that home to kids, you know. How hard was it for you during the pandemic? Uh, because I'm sure that must have affected you in some way. Yeah, it was it was tough. It was blended learning. Um, we had a lot of online Zooms. And obviously with the with the guidelines from the HSE, we, as soon as we were able to get back on the pitch, we were on the pitch. But yeah, look, it was very, it, it's not so difficult for me, Jerry, but really difficult for the kids. Um, but in fairness, what we done was, we, we had a, a strength and conditioning coach and we had, we were working with them on a daily basis. So they were still doing their strength and conditioning, their fitness. I know it's not the same as being on the pitch and they were also doing their education. But yeah, I felt I really felt for the kids because they missed, for the beginning of the year, they probably missed 10 weeks on the pitch, 12 weeks, uh, I think in general. So yeah, it was tough for them. But again, I have to say, testament to them, even when we come back and on our last fitness test with them, some were really, really good. So it just goes to show if you can provide the information for them and they're working hard and that's brilliant for us, you know. One of the side effects of Brexit is that young Irish footballers can no longer go to England, Scotland or Wales at 16 years of age because of FIFA's rules around international transfer of minors and the fact that Britain is no longer in the uh, in the EU. Does that make a course like this even more important for, for our young footballers? Yeah, I think it does, yeah, I really do. I, I firmly believe with this debate has been going on for for 30 years more, you know, about kids going away. But for me, it's number one, it's down to the individual, you know, so everyone's different. It might suit you, Jerry, going to England. You might thrive in that environment and I might really freeze in that environment. So for me, one of the selling points of the course at the beginning was, can we let develop these players in their own environment where they're going home to their parents at night, that they're meeting their friends, they're playing the weekend, they're not going back to a room at one o'clock in the afternoon. You know, um, and again, mental health as well, and that you know. So for me, it comes down to the individual. Second, to, at the minute, and with Brexit, can we can we provide for the high potential players? So can we cater for high potential players, real high potential players, the likes of Adam Ede, Jason Knight was going away. At the minute, if you're asking me, do we have that environment structure in place? I don't think we do. Um, I think we still need these players at that, at that level. Need probably still to go away. Um, with that in mind, young Kevin Zeffi just signed for Inter Milan. So he needs to be in that environment where he's getting challenged every day and, you know, catered for for his high potential. But I really do feel the other side of the coin is in, in, in the link with the League of Ireland is we need to be providing more of these courses and even from younger. This is only a starting point for me. I think we should be from secondary school all the way up, you know, from fourth year to sixth year. Um, so I think, yeah, 100% we need to provide more of these courses and then leading into the leaving cert um, would be a three-year cycle leading into total level. 
but to even strip it back again, I would say going in fourth year and giving a longer cycle with the players because I think anyone, that, any coach you'll speak to in football, you can't substitute full time training. You know, full time training is key to developing their players. And we've got an opportunity at the minute. Brexit could be seen as an opportunity for us. And one thing I've really seen was the young players, and a lot of them in, have come off their course and, and from the club, giving, giving them opportunities at fourth team level. You know, I see young Dawson and Ross and getting games with both. Brilliant. And they're in the 21 squad. So I think it's a two sided coin, really, isn't it? Like, there's two ways of looking at it. But I do feel, if you're asking me an honest, an honest opinion, it's definitely down to the individual you know, and, and family decision. And, and you know, just to focus on, on this football and fitness transition year course that, that, that we're running here in Fingal, um, it's a very, obviously a very successful model. Is it something that can be rolled out in other parts of the country? Yeah, uh, I'd I recently done a presentation for an A-Elite licence um, and there's a lot of boys on it, for high-profile director of football around the country and there's a lot of interest in the course. Um I, I believe Shamrock Sham Grove was speaking to them as well. They're going to run a pilot this year. Um, see the likes of Galway, Galway United, the likes of Cork, all interested in the programme. So I can really see it taking off. Um, and I think it's two different models, you know. It can be a hybrid model in Dublin, in the country, um, where you've got one club, one town type of thing in Galway. It can be a real club model as well, you know. So, mm. But I, don't, I do think it's about, you know, it's about... Joint, joint up thinking, collaboration between the councils, the FAI, the clubs. I think we, we owe it to the players, to be honest with you. And it's their responsibility now, particularly being involved in international football myself, between 16 and 18. We've got to, we've got to fill that gap now of players not going away and developing them, uh, even from a strength and conditioning point of view. You know, um, So along with the clubs, obviously the clubs do fantastic work. But as I keep going back to full-time football, for me, in my opinion, is key. Yeah, and and one thing that struck me about the course is that um, all the participants on it uh, are boys. Um, are there any plans to roll out a similar course for girls? Yes, and as I spoke earlier on, to a guy, the, the foot, when I started in the FAI in two thousand and five, there was these big visions of a national league. There was no even national league. Now there's a national league for senior players. There's an underage national league. So the next thing for me has got to be full time courses for full time girls. Um, and I have spoken to our line manager about this, if you and there is, there is uh, pilot plans in place, hopefully, for to get something going in 2022, which will be next September. But I do feel there wouldn't be, there's not enough demand in Fingal for what to stand alone. So it's got to be a hybrid model where it's, it's it could be three or four councils coming together uh, and, and put one of these programs on in our standalone program. Maybe. Yeah, and I think you mentioned demand there, but I think it's more it's more about quality, isn't it? That that it's it's important that you have um, quality players on on the course rather than just filling the numbers. Yeah, and quality is key. It's key because obviously, as we always go back to that mantra, the, the best playing with the best, you know, we bring out the best type of thing. So, and that's what it needs to be. Um, and and you find, you know, those talented players if they're playing with each other every day, the difference is unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable, and they come on leaps and bounds. So, yeah, to answer your question, I, I really feel there's a real push on this and, and I'm hoping in 2022, I firmly believe that there will be a girls one. Um, that's great news. Um, the course, of course, is not the only partnership between Fingal County Council and the FAI. Indeed, I think the relationship goes back to about 2007 when, when you uh, were actually among the first group of co-funded development officers appointed by the council and the FAI. Yeah, do you remember yeah. that? <laughs> I do indeed. <laughs> the now, all right. Um, just in terms of partnerships as well, just to mention, I know Fingal as well, Fingal and the FU, but Empower have also been a big stakeholder for us and a big partnership from day one to Felix Healy. So they've been a real um, driving force behind the course and, and sponsored us as well. So we're really grateful for that. Um, but in terms of, you're right, and the partnership between the FUI and Fingal, there's another five of that map. And their they're, they're remit is to develop grassroots football in uh, Fingal area and again they're there to help out with the clubs you know assist them uh, grow the game or every level there's a big push on the, on the girls game and I say it's really developed and grown particularly in the Fingal area over the last four or five years I have to say and um, so yeah I have to say without the support of the council these programs wouldn't go ahead you know yeah and, and I suppose that's one thing about football is that um, it, it's one of those um, sports that really gets into communities and, and can be used to tackle social issues yeah, absolutely. So again, there's, there's numerous programs, and and again, it's 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 
it's for the grassroots element and, and look at the social element now, particularly everyone sees we're, 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 we're just after going through in the middle of a pandemic, how important is the socialise, get out, even if it's an hour a day, an hour a week, football for, for kids, you know, integrating with each other, building relationships with each other. So again, the clubs do a lot of that work, but it's fantastic to have uh, the development officers there to assist them. And again, through, through coach education as well, you know, educating and developing players as well at that level, because that's where the, all the players start in grassroots football. You know, mm-hmm. I remember listening to John O'Shea recently doing an interview and how proud he spoke about with starting out with Shamar, you know, and I'm sure if he spoke to Andrew Adabami, how proud he'd be to work leagues they've done for him. So these volunteers, these people are the ones that really grow the game, you know. They're coming along to us and we're lucky enough to be in a position to work with high quality players, whether it be here or international football, but really grassroots football is the ones that drives football in this country, you know, and yeah. how important it is. Yeah, and, and how important is it to have the local authority working with a, a national sports body like the FAI? I think it's key. I think it's key. As I say, you mentioned I was the first co-funded one back in, it was actually 2005, I think it was, but I started in November 2005. So before that, it was there was only national, there was only regional uh, development officers. So if you can imagine a regional development officer trying to cover all them clubs and all those, uh, all those areas, so it's, it's, it's actually impossible. Yeah. Well, I remember they were covering two or three counties at the time. So now it's more in, in the community, you know, there is a face in the community helping out and driving and to say to, to, the, to the council in terms of even sponsorship for local sports grants, you know, um, all weathers, sports capital grants, uh, coach education. It's been phenomenal since, since the day I started doing anyway. Yeah, and, and I suppose, like as you say, Fingal County Council was the, the first council to employ um, sort of local development officers and that. And not only has it sort of spread across all the 31 local authorities around the country, but they've also entered into partnerships with other sports. Yeah, they've also, I think they've got, they've got cricket, um, tennis Ireland, you know, rugby. Um, there's, there's that, Fingal is a leader, you know, across the, across the, the, the country. And the, the, the beautiful thing about it for me is if you go around to any ground in the country and you're talking about transition here, they all know it's Fingal County Council and the FAI. You say, oh, that's the one in Fingal, you know. Um, I was recently at, in the writing camp and one of the kids uh, got injured and we're waiting for his father to come. Uh, it's a real high potential player and I was just introduced myself. Oh, you, you run that course in Fingal and Cardiff and the kid was, this fellow was from Tipperary. So I was like, well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's really well known out there and I'm hoping yeah. and that's what we're, we're, we're looking to do now. So we're a bit like with the development officers, let's, let's get more of these courses around the country as well. You know, take the lead on and let others follow, you know, because I think we owe it to the kids, particularly with Brexit, you know. Yeah. Well, at the beginning of the, the interview, we talked about Andrew Oma Bamadili and his achievement in becoming the first graduate from the course to play senior international football for Ireland. You mentioned people like Kevin Zeffi and, and that who's just, just come off the course. Are, are, you know, are there any others that are going to follow in Andrew's footsteps? I don't like to mention players, Jerry. <laughs> I don't like to put pressure on players, but there's certainly a lot of high potential players um, coming through and have come off the course, you know, over the last couple of years and really making strides. As I say, we, we trained the under 21 squad, you know, so that's the, just the level below. And a lot of, as I say, a lot of high potential into the 17s and 19s. So for me, I don't like doing that with kids because you see when, when kids get that pressure on them, sometimes it's, you know, we build them up too much. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I, I, I would certainly feel over the next five years, we certainly have ones that be, should be in around that, that standard for sure. Yeah. And, and just one question, just I, I did mention Kevin Zeffi and that from Blanchardstown. He was on the course last year. Mm-hmm. He's gone to into Milan. Um, you know, we, we've been speaking about players going to England and, and Scotland and, and that during the course of our conversation. But do you see kids maybe heading towards the continent and, and following in the footsteps of Kevin and, and going going to other countries? Yeah, I do. I do. I've seen it already. Um, Andrew's, or sorry, Kevin, there was another uh, uh, student we had from Blanchestown, Justin Farigi, and he also went to Roma for, for trials as well this year. So there seems to be an interest from the foreign countries now because they know the market is here and the kids aren't going to England. So to answer your question, yeah, and it could be a fantastic learning experience for some of them as well. But again, as I said earlier on, it goes down to the individual, you know. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, to answer that question, I would say yes, there will be players going abroad and a different education in football as well and different environment, different culture, different philosophy in some of the clubs. Yeah. So yeah, so 
It's interesting. But again, I think it really is down to the individual, you know, for, for me um, on, on that decision. You know, I think Kevin's family's moving on with him as well. Mm-hmm. And, and you might be adding language classes to to the uh, to the modules for, on the course, maybe. Interesting, you say that, Gary, because that's something that certainly sprung to mind, um, and it's something that we, we were we were talking about during the summer. So, yeah, as I say, we're, we're adding to the course again all the time. So, yeah, it, it could be something. Yeah, you're right. That could be coming down the line. Yeah, you're back again on on Monday, September the the thirteenth with the the twenty twenty one twenty twenty two course. Um, I, are you I, are you surprised by how successful the course has become? Well, Auntie, no, no, I, I I'm surprised how if you said to me we have a, a, a one of our students going on the international team three years after he graduated, I would said no, I don't think that's going to happen. But I'm surprised the success and and the amount of people and interest in the course. Um, but I'm also surprised um, how we haven't really kicked on with it in other areas, so other councils, because a lot of councils ring me, a lot of League of Ireland clubs have spoke to me, how it hasn't really started there yet. But I really feel now over the last couple of months with Brexit, really a bit of a warning sign for, for people saying, right, we need to cater for these kids now. So I think it's a real push on it now. So I think when they're looking at the success of some of the players that come off the course, and remember, we're only we're only giving them one year of full time training. So I think there's the potential that we give our players three years, and um, the difference in them. And, and the, the one thing I always say, Jerry, to to the kids when they come in the first day, and, and even the parents and their parents night is, some kids come into the course and they're looking at guys that are that are high level international players, and by by the third week they're saying I can be as good as him. I can be as good as him. And then all of a sudden you see them come on lead. They say, I'm working. They're the, they're the parameter for these kids. And they work so hard to pass them by. And that, that's a real joy for me to see that happen. And that's why I think if we have more of these um, courses, you will see more of these players popping out, these nuggets coming out of nowhere, because they're in their own environment. They're working hard. And that they know the barometer because they're challenging themselves against the best players on the course who they know are international players. So that for me is a no-brainer, to be honest with you, around the whole country. No-brainer. Well, that's great, Dennis. Um, we're, we're out of time, but listen, thank you very much indeed for, for talking to us. And uh, you've certainly given us a fascinating insight, not only into the world of football, but also into the the, the TY football and fitness course that uh, is run by Fingal County Council and the FAI in Cordoff Sports Centre. Good luck with your the coming school year uh, and that, and, and good luck with it. And, and hopefully in, in, in the years to come, you'll continue to produce uh, great um, nuggets and, and great football talent like Andrew Oma Badili. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks for having me. So that's it for episode 13 of Inside Fingal. My thanks to Dennis Highland, course coordinator at the Fingal County Council, FAI Football and Fitness Transition Year course, and best wishes to him and all the students who will be taking part in this year's course. If you want further information on the course, you can email dennis.highland at fai.ie or fingalsports at fingal.ie. Before we go, I'm delighted to announce that the Inside Fingal podcast has been shortlisted for a Chambers Ireland Excellence in Local Government Award in the Local Authority Innovation category. And everybody on the team is absolutely delighted to have received this prestigious nomination. Thank you. If you have any comments or suggestions in relation to the Inside Fingal podcast, please email podcast at fingal.ie. Remember, you can follow Fingal County Council on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube and LinkedIn and also at fingal.ie. Thank you for listening. Until the next time, goodbye and stay safe.